Hi, everybody. Um, good afternoon. We're going to get started on our third EPI webinar um, in our three webinar series. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, today we're going to talk about case studies in field epidemiology, and we picked two case studies, um, one with an infectious disease component and one with a non-infectious disease um, component. And then we're going to build off of the skills that we've learned in the first two webinars as we investigate these two um, clusters or outbreaks. So I'm going to go through just some basic information to recap um, what we learned in the last two webinars, and then we're going to jump in. And I hope that you find that these are fun outbreaks um, to look at. I don't know if you will have heard of these before, um, but I did get them from the Cases and Fields Epidemiology, a Global Perspective book, and the image of that book is right there on that first slide. Um, and it's full of really neat investigations, so if you're interested in, in learning a little bit more about history or um, some really cool yeah, investigations, you can, you can check it out. So for our objectives, we're going to look at uh, two different cases, and I already mentioned um, that we're going to really build off those skills that we learned. So just for a little review, um, what is epidemiology? So if we go back to that first webinar, epidemi um, to get diabetes, all those different factors that come into play in health, epidemiology likes to study. And they like to look at from a population perspective. Um, and the whole goal is to be able to do those studies, look at that data, and then be able to put in some good public health action to make a difference um, with health. So you remember. Descriptive epidemiology is one of the two um, key components of epidemiology. The second one is analytical epidemiology. Um, and descriptive epidemiology is the one that I focused a lot on the last two webinars. And we're going to focus on that again today. So remember, descriptive epi looks at person, place, and time. So when you look at person, it could be characterized by age, race, sex, education, all those different types of things. For place, it could be where people live where they go to school, where they work, um, different events that they may have gone to, and then time. When is it happening? What season is it happening? Um, and how long are people sick? So all those things are really key when we look at um, investigations. For a reminder on our definition, um, cluster is when we just have you know, a number of cases that are above our baseline, but it's not really widespread. You just have a couple of cases and it's a cluster. Endemic means that it's the presence of a disease in a geographical area that's always there. Um, it's endemic, so it means it's, it's constantly there at some level. Epidemic is when we have that above baseline number of diseases, and it usually involves a larger number of people. So if you look at the Ebola um, epidemic that's going on right now in West Africa, that's a prime example of that. And then pandemic, meaning that worldwide epidemic. And an example of that is when we had H1N1 back in 2009, where we had that new flu strain that circulated across the whole globe. So for every investigation, these are the steps. And if you remember, these steps, um, they don't necessarily always happen in order. And sometimes you might have to repeat a step. And some steps might be done earlier in the investigation. So step number 10, communicate the findings. That's something that you might do, you know, right after you prepare. <laughs> Remember that these steps are just our basis and what we can kind of go off of during an investigation. There are the tools that we talked about in our second webinar, and line lists and epi curves and maps are some of those key tools. We're going to look at epi curves again today, um, and also look at an example of a, of a map that was used um, during an investigation. So these are all these tools that we. Uh, had talked about before. So let's jump right into our first investigation. It's the bubbles outbreak. It's a really fun name. So if we start, a call comes in from the Benton Franklin County Health Department in Washington State. Comes in in August and they're requesting assistance because they're seeing a cluster of cases of a febrile illness in adolescents. And they're seeing a couple of reports come in from providers that are seeing these um, teenagers in their office. The main symptoms are fever, headache, muscle aches, and some of them have a stiff neck. There were about 35 to 40 cases when this call came in. So what are we going to do first to prepare? So I'm just going to take a minute to think about this. And if you'd like, feel free to answer on the call. Everyone's unmuted, so you can um, chime right in. Or if you want, you can put something in the chat box. But what are the first things that we're going to want to do to prepare 
um, for this investigation. All right, well, I'll give you the answer. So the first couple things we're going to want to do is prepare for field work. So this call comes into the health department. This is all that you know. So, you know, what, what do we need to do to prepare? First thing is try and think about, well, what can be causing these illnesses? What are some of the causative agents for this time of year that these teenagers could be getting? So you want to think about arboviral because it's um, summertime. Think about fungal infections, especially in that part of the country. Coccidiomycosis is a, is a big one. Um, different enteroviruses, which circulate in the summer and fall. I think we're all very familiar with the enterovirus D68 that's out there right now. So, you know, is this an enterovirus? Or is it a certain type of uh, encephalitis? So what could be causing it? Think about the time of year, especially because it's summer. You want to take a look at what's going on in one part of the country, but is it you know, now spreading? And then look at travel or group gatherings. So you know, have these teens recently traveled to another part of the world um, and they're just coming back on a mission trip? Or did they all gather together at a conference or a sporting event? <clears throat> so these are certain things that you want to try and you know, put down these notes, gather these ideas, brainstorm them um, for going out to do field work. You also want to determine if this is an outbreak because if, it's n if this is their normal baseline that they have, then maybe we don't really need to be doing a full-out investigation. In this case, the physicians are saying that they never see teenagers um, with this, the same symptoms this time of year um, at these numbers. So because of this, we're going to definitely consider this an outbreak because it's a higher number than we would normally see um, at this time in this population. And some of the first things that we're going to do when we go out into the field is do a review of the charts of the cases. So can we see what the note, notes were from the physicians? Can we look at lab testing that was done? We want to look and see how long their illness was lasting and really get a good feel for what symptoms. So in this particular investigation, we're going to find out that the illness is lasting about five to seven days and rash, diarrhea, and respiratory symptoms are uncommon. We're not seeing it very often um, in these teenagers. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to interview the cases and really try and figure out are there any commonalities between all these teenagers. And when we interview them, we find that there's no common meals, um, there's no gatherings or special occasions. Um, so it's really hard to find that common exposure at first glance when you're talking to people. But then one patient during this investigation says, you know, Maybe you should check out the bubbles. So if you have one case, say, maybe you should check this out, what do you do? You know, do you actually check it out or do you not? And this all goes into um, the investigation, and I think over time people develop skills with investigations. They might get that gut feeling and say, huh, yeah, you know, there might be something to that. You know, maybe we should take a look at it. So in this particular investigation, one patient said, you should check it out. And indeed, they did go and check it out. So what are the bubbles? So I have to tell you, this outbreak takes place in the 1960s. It was 1964, I believe, when this, um, when this was happening in Washington. And the bubbles is a concrete block structure. Um, it's an irrigation system, and it had two streams and a pump that pushed the water down these two streams. And it caused all these bubbles and all this churning water um, in this system. And there are about 800 gallons of water that pass through every second in this irrigation system. So if you look at it, this does not look like some place that I would really want to visit. Um, but for teenagers, in the summer, when it's hot, it's a prime location for swimming. So when they would start checking this out and they were talking to people, the bubbles came up a lot. It became this like watering hole um, where people went to swim. And um, interesting. Very interesting. You just never know when you start your investigation, and I don't think this is probably at the top of their list on their radar when they were doing these um, case investigations with, with these teenagers. So let's take a little deeper look at the bubbles. Um, students would stand on the wall, jump into the bubbling water, be swirled around, and then slammed into the wall of the bubbles. So they got a lot of fun out of this. This is a cool thing to do. It also caused all abrasions when this happened. Um, and when they re-interviewed the cases, it showed that they all had swam at the bubbles. So there's our common exposure with all of these high school students. So now we know this. What are we going to do now? 
um, what, what what's really our next steps in this investigation now that we know this? We're going to test the water, yeah. Take a look at the water. What's going on there? So if we look closely at that irrigation system um, and that water source, we're going to find out that the water is not potable. The source is from the Columbia River, and there's a high coliform count, and the water is also very alkaline here um, when we look just at that water and that irrigation system. If you see, here's a map um, with the Columbia River right here. And then here is that irrigation canal going down. And then this bifurcator is the thing or the machine that caused all those bubbles and all that churning water. And then it went down to basically two different streams. So to take a better look at this, the epidemiologist actually got in a crop duster and flew over this whole area uh, with somebody from the health department to take a look at what was surrounding this irrigation system. And talk about really boots on the ground, huh? I don't know if I would ever be getting into a plane here in Nashua to go fly around, but I guess you never know. So here, they got in the plane and they flew around and they saw that there was a pasture with cattle. There were about 300 cattle right near um, this irrigation canal and where you have all this action going on. So that was of interest to them when they, when they were doing this. And you can also see the positive and negative water cultures that they took. You can see where they had um, different water cultures that were taken. So our hypothesis is going to be, is it possible the herd of cattle upstream contaminated the water used in the irrigation system um, and caused what we now know as leptos leptospirosis? When they did the case investigation and they talked to the physicians, they took additional blood samples from the cases and they sent them to the lab because lab testing is obviously one of those really key things if you can figure out what the causative agent is. So they did the blood test in the students and they also did urine tests and blood tests of the cattle and it all confirmed leptospirosis as a causative agent. Um, the cattle had not been vaccinated for lepto and they were purchased that spring. So this was the first time the, those sorts of cattle were in that area. And they found that the water from the fields of the cattle war were also tested positive for leptospirosis. So if you look again at where this is and where those cattle are and where that system is, where they're swimming, there's a source of contamination there. And they found that if the fields where the cattle were, if they were peeing in the fields and it rained or they had something like that happen, it was washing all of that into that irrigation system where the kids were swimming. Um, so if we think about public health action, you know, what do we need to do about this? They ended up fencing off the cattle so they couldn't use the canal as a watering hole because that was also happening. So not only was there a concern about their urine contaminating the water, but they were also drinking from there. They were probably peeing in that area, you know, a whole bunch of stuff with the, with the cattle. They also put up signs and warned the community about swimming there and saying, you know, you really need to stay away here. And then they also prevented irrigation of the fields with the cattle roam to prevent that wash off of contaminants in the fields into that water system. Um, so once they were able to figure this all out, they were able to put some, some action into place. And I'll just say that leptospirosis isn't something that we hear about a lot um, in the country. And it's also really hard to test. It's not an easy microbe to culture out or to, to get in, um, tested in a lab. So they had to use the CDC specifically um, as their source to, to test for those specimens. So that's why this is a really tougher bug to identify um, in situations like this. So they ended up doing a follow-up study of all 6,062 students that went to the three local high schools and the middle schools in the area around this irrigation system. And according to that survey, 594 swam at the bubbles or in the canal. So about 10% of those students swam there that summer, and 60 of them had illness compatible with leptospirosis. So if you look, and you remember back when we were calculating our attack rates, if you look at all those that were exposed, which was 594, and the total number of cases, which was 60, our attack rate in that population was 10% for that summer. They found that all the teenagers were between the ages of 12 and 19, but the older they got, um, it was the more, there were more students that were 17, 18, and 19 than the younger kids. So there's definitely more the, the seniors in high school. 87% were male. They all swim with the bubbles and it happened during the summer. 
So here's just <clears throat> a picture of their um, part of their analysis. So they looked at gender and um, age and all the kids, and then it just goes to show um, how they're able to look at, at some of that data. Here's the epi curve for this outbreak, and this top one is the temperature. So they were trying to look and see if there's a correlation between high temperatures and students more likely to go swimming because it's hot outside and the public pool was busy a lot that summer. So here's the epi curve. You can see there's a lot of ups and downs. If you go back to our second webinar, um, you can take a look at what type of epi curve this is and that there's exposures and then it ends, and then there's more exposures, and it ends. This is something that happened all summer long, and it could correlate a little bit with these higher temperatures that you're seeing. Um, but again, it's kind of, kind of all a little sporadic, but there was some correlation there with that. So um, if we take a look at this outbreak investigation, some of the information that was really pertinent to here were lab tests from the students and from the cattle, being able to do that environmental assessment, getting the data from the charts, um, were all really important information for this. And then working with partners is really important because they had to work with the hospitals and the healthcare providers. They had to work with the labs. They also had to work with the county that they're in or the city that they're in um, to be able to do an environmental assessment, to be able to get in a crop duster and look to see what's going on. They had to work with the cattle farmers um, and the people on the ranch because a lot of the public health actions you know, had to do with them, so they had to work with them and partner with them. And they also partnered with the media because when they were looking for cases actively when this was first happening, they asked the media to put out a notice to say that if you had these symptoms and you were a student um, and you had swam at the bubble, to call the health department. So they were doing that active case investigation. And then they also had a partner with the schools and they did the follow-up study. So partners in an investigation like this is just so important and key to be able to figure out what's going on and then to be able to do the appropriate public health um, actions in something like this. So hopefully you liked this one. I thought it was kind of neat and it was different. Um, and it employed a lot of the tools that we had learned about in the, the first two um, webinars. So that is our first outbreak. Any questions on that first one? Yeah. Yeah, Ashley. Um, so it did they count for how many times the kids went to the bubbles? Like, if one kid went like every day, one week, did yeah. it be more likely to have leptospirosis? That is a really good question, and they did look at that. And part of the survey that they did follow up, they asked them, "How many times did you go there?" And they found that kids that went there more often were more likely to get sick, but they still had some cases that had only gone there once, and they got sick that very first time that they were there. They also looked at chronic medical conditions that the students had, and if they did have like a, um, a chronic condition like asthma or diabetes, they were more likely to get ill than kids that were completely healthy. Um, so they did look at a couple of those things when they, when they were doing the study, um, which, was, which is good. That's really interesting to know. Um, and then if anything ever happened like this again, they would have a lot of that data to be able to say, you're more likely to get ill from this, or you know, what can you do to prevent it? Um, they ended up with 61 total cases as a result of this at the end of the summer, um, which is a lot if you, if you think about it. You know, a 10% attack rate is pretty, that's pretty high for, um, for that group. They know if it got in through the scrapes or were they swallowing the water too? Another good question. There were a couple routes of transmission for this. One were the skin abrasions, and they felt that that was one pathway of entry for the pathogen. The other one was the mucosal membranes of their eyes and their mouth. So when they were jumping in, they were going underwater, um, whether they were ingesting it or absorbing it through their um, mucosal membranes. That was the second way of transmission that they found um, for it. And all the kids did recover. They didn't have any deaths as a result of this, which is good. All right, so the second one. Um, I hope I'm going to try and convey how neat this actually is as part of an investigation, because if you read the book, it really gets juicy, and it's, um, it's really cool when you read it. So I'm going to try and do my best to make it just as cool in a webinar. And this is um, taking place in Ukraine. It takes place um, post-World War II and in the 
I think it was the 1970s um, when Ukraine was going through a lot of change. And they were having revolts. There was a lot going on with the military. Um, it was 1988. Um, so what was happening is a lot of the kids in certain, certain Um, a lot of the kids were losing their hair. So this is an example of a non-communicable disease um, investigation. So this illness was being called the Chernitsky illness, and there were several hundred children in this Ukrainian city that were coming down with this mysterious illness. The key symptoms were alopecia, or complete loss of their hair, upper respiratory symptoms, and night terrors. Um, when they were first starting to investigate this, they narrowed it down pretty quickly to a chemical toxin, something chemical in the environment that these kids are being exposed to. The incidence of cases peaked in October and November, so this really took place in the fall. And as a result of this, families fled the city. Um, they also banned traffic in the center of the city. They hosed down the roofs and streets, and leaf burning was banned. And as we get more into this discussion, you'll understand why they did those things um, as part of this. So this is really... Um, really curious. When this first came up, they really didn't know what was going on. So this is not infectious, and even though it's not infectious, you still use the same tools like epi curves, line lists, case investigations, um, chart reviews. You can use all your same tools, but sometimes the lab tests that you use are going to be very different, and the, your considerations or developing your hypotheses are going to be slightly different. So when we look at this, we need to think about Okay, well, if we think it's a chemical, what chemical cause these symptoms? Maybe try and generate a list of those top 10 chemicals that cause it. Um, maybe take a look at the environment, you know, what factories are in the area, what, um, you know, is there anything going on with the military, and, you know, are they making certain weapons in the area? Um, so you have to think about the time, where they're located, and, and the cultural factors of, of this. So... Our next steps are going to look at descriptive epidemiology, that person, place, and time, determining a case definition. And in this case, there are case definitions for all children with sudden onset of alopecia who presented to a clinic, a pediatric clinic, between July and December. And the clinic that's mentioned here, pediatric clinic number two, was the one designated by the government to take all kids that were having this mysterious illness and to make them go there so they were being seen by the same doctors and they had all their specialists go in. Also going to review case charts and interview cases. And um, I'll tell you that this epidemiologist is from the United States. He was from the University of Illinois. And he was asked by the WHO because of his expertise to go out to Ukraine and do this investigation. So he was asked to go out there and, and try and provide some help after WHO kind of met some stumbling blocks and didn't really know where to go. So this investigation took months and months. And it took a long time before they figured out what was actually going on. So one other thing we can do is create a spot map. So remember, maps are a great way to look at where cases are um, in a city. And I'll just tell you that on the right-hand side of this slide, this is pre, you know, lots of computer programs in the Ukraine and, you know, availability of statistical software. So they actually did their charts and bar charts and things like that on paper using colored pencils. So this is an actual picture of what it looks like when they were doing this in the field. So talking about real field investigation with not a lot of access to sometimes technology. And this is their chart looking at symptoms. Um, so it's just really neat to take a look and, and see where we've come since then. So here's the epi curve. And you can see that there's definitely a peak in that October, November um, time frame. And here's their spot map. So it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see where those dots are. And most of the dots are centered in the center of the city, or the old part of the city, um, where a lot of the history is in, in that main area. So looking at our charts and taking a look at our, and talking to our cases, we find that 92% were between one and five years of age. Um, boys and girls were equally affected. Because of our case definition, 100% had alopecia, because that was in our case definition. They had to have that in order to be included. 89% had upper respiratory symptoms, 60% had sleep disturbances, and 58% had behavioral changes. All cases were located in the older part of the city um, near an industrial plant. 
So if you take a look at the map, you can see where the different plants and manufacturer, um, manufac the factories are. And during this investigation, they were told the plant was off limits during the investigation, meaning that they couldn't go there, they couldn't ask questions, very secret, squirrely type of thing. Because you have to remember what this country was going through at this time frame. Um, there was a lot of military stuff going on. So that plant was off limits. So as part of the investigation, they started to look at um, the families and the environment. So some families had more than one child affected, and um, they definitely ascertained that there was no spread person to person. So this was definitely not an infectious disease. There were no outbreaks in, that pertained to a particular school. Um, the respiratory illness preceded the alopecia by two weeks. And when they did clinical specimens and scalp scraping, they didn't really find a causative agent. So there was, you know, again, there's no infectious agent there. They looked into radiation, because if you remember, Chernobyl uh, had happened two years prior. And in Chernobyl, they had a huge radi radi um, nuclear power plant meltdown, and it created this whole plume of radiation that went over this city. So they thought maybe this had something to do with it, but radiation experts say, that wasn't enough radiation, and it was too long ago. So that wasn't a part of the factor here. And environmental toxicologists ruled out water and diet as sources for possible exposure. Um, they did bioassays for pesticides. Those were negative. And one big question was why is this only affecting children? So you have to remember that sometimes in countries like this and in investigations like this, you can't always rely on all of the information that you're given. So sometimes if one group did a study and said this is what we found, you don't always know that's true. So when you're doing an epi study, you really want to look at all your facts. You want to put together your, your hypothesis and um, make your best judgment possible when doing this. You don't. Do so you want to take all of that environmental sampling into account? But you also want to do your true epi um, and not really take anything out just because of a sample. Here are um, some images of playgrounds that were adjacent to a housing complex that had a large cluster of cases. They looked at environments in, in even places like the playground. And they did some soil testing, and they found that the soil had a lot of thallium, aluminum, and boron. And there were some other theories out there. There was um, a truck that was taking rocket fuel um, from one part of the city to another that had um, near there. That was one suggested theory. There's also the chemical plume um, when we talk about Chernobyl, but then also, you know, are there other chemical plumes coming from factories? And then cab drivers said that they were adding thallium to gasoline because the quality of gasoline was really bad. So they were adding things like this to um, try and make their gas go farther. So when you look at this, thallium, to the researchers, when they did the environmental testing and they looked at what was going on, was really a key indicator. They're like, this is really pointing thallium. The symptoms pointed to it. The um, fact that it was found in the soil was pointing to thallium. There's a lot pointing to it. But because of what was going on at that time in the country, they totally dismissed that thallium was a causative, the cause of the children losing their hair. And when you look at chemical factors, especially chemicals, you have to remember that children are not little adults. They're very different from adults. They are often the highest risk group for environmental poisoning. They have a different neurological um, capacity than adults do. They're still developing. Um, they are affected a lot more by environmental contaminants. So that could be a reason why children in this case are being affected by adults not. So in the end, they found and confirmed that it was thallium, but it took them over a year to get government to open up and allow them to look at things like that factory that I mentioned, or that, that industry that was off limits. And when they finally opened up and declassified all these documents, they found that soil samples had concentrations that were six times higher than background for thallium. They also took specimens of hair, nail, blood, and urine from the children, and they had high concentrations of thallium. Um, it was found in the air and wastewater from five different factories that were in the area, and it was also detected in locally grown foods. So all the epi that they were doing were pointed to thallium, but because of all this classified information, they weren't able to confirm that it was, in fact, thallium. Um, but they had started to treat it as thallium once all the epi had pointed to it. So it wasn't until, again, a year later that they, they found this out. To this day, they still have not found the exact source, 
but there's been a lot of speculation that points to a factory that was making equipment, um, and one of their main chemicals was thallium. And what they were doing is they were burning the waste in a kiln, which contaminated everything. So when the waste was being burned, it was being aerosolized, and it was contaminating everything that it fell on. So the playgrounds, the streets, the gardens, everything in that area. And because children like to put things in their mouth, uh, I have a two-year-old, so I know this for a fact. Everything goes in their mouth. They're playing outside in the playground, and they put that in their mouth. Um, if they're eating from those local gardens, they're getting high doses of thallium, and they were definitely having signs and symptoms. Um, so that is how they eventually found out that it was indeed thallium um, as part of this. So that's the end of that outbreak investigation. And hopefully it kind of gave a little flavor to how different epi tools are used um, during this. And I'll just mention that on the second outbreak, they had wanted to do a case control study where they looked at the cases um, and found controls from the same pediatric clinic that were the same age that did not have alopecia to try and identify different um, commonalities or differences between those two groups, and the government never allowed it. So um, I think had they done that, they probably would have found thallium a little bit sooner, but they, they weren't allowed to do the study. So that is it. So I get any questions on the second investigation? Yeah, have they... Um have they monitored those 110 kids over the last 25 years to see if this led to mm. any other problems? That is a good question. And, you know, the book did say something about this This one epidemiologist. It was interesting because he was actually from Ukraine. He had grown up in Ukraine and moved to America and then became an environmental epidemiologist, believe it or not. And then he received some funding uh, from a Ukrainian organization here in the States to do work over there. So I think they did do some sort of follow-up with them, but he didn't really mention uh, what the long term day he's still doing some work um, over there in this area um, directly relating to environmental contaminants. What are some ways you can like now that the soil is contaminated, the gardens are contaminated, like, mm. like how can you reduce the exposure? That? Thank you for bringing that up because I forgot to go back to that. So remember on the first slide of this outbreak I had mentioned that they had hosed down the roof and the street and that they had banned um, cars from driving in the center of town and that they prevented leaf burning, it's because the government probably the government probably knew that it was thallium, but they weren't releasing it. So when they were washing down the roofs and the streets, um, they were trying to flush, I think, any of the contaminants that had landed on those surfaces away. And then with the soil, what they had done is they were turning the soil so that they were trying to mix it up because then if the concentration of thallium is spread out amongst, you know, maybe two feet of soil instead of just that top one inch layer, they're diluting the concentration of thallium. So they were trying to do things like that to prevent people from getting exposed to such high concentrations. As far as the gardens go, they didn't say at all in the article what they did, but my guess is that they would have to take out all the soil that was contaminated um, from the, where the gardens are, put new soil, and then they would reduce that um, contaminant as much as they possibly could. So this is a neat one, huh? Isn't this kind of cool? You know, using Epi to try and find out something like this when, even when you can't get all the info. I wonder what the impact was for moms, like if they were pregnant during this time, like if they had babies. There was a lot of talk about moms in this in this article, and um, parents were so upset about what was going on, and parents knew that something wasn't being told and that something was happening. That a lot of families fled the city, so those that could left because they knew something was going on, the government wasn't telling them um, the whole story, and they, they left. Um, they didn't mention too much about pregnant moms, but some of the work that this epidemiologist did in follow-up was on maternal child care, so that could have been something that he looked at a little bit more closely. So, um, so again, this is the book that these case studies came out of. So they have a whole bunch in here that are really cool. Here's just um, some resources about epidemiology and case studies. And then here's my contact information. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. And if you have any other questions, you can either just shout it out on the, on the phone or you can also type it in our chat. And I will be sure to send out the slides via email. And then we'll also post this recording to our website. So if there's you know others from your organization that weren't able to make it, they are welcome to um, to check us out on our website. 
and there is a small survey that um, will pop up when you exit. So I just ask that you fill that out, and if you would like a certificate showing that you attended this webinar, um, please um, fill out the survey and send me an email, and I'll be happy to send you one um, so you can get some contact hours. And then one last thing is if you notice in the chat box, I did put the link there so you can automatically download the PowerPoint slides um, if you like. Um, those are there. And I don't see anybody chatting anything. Um, so with that, um, I'll give anybody one last chance. Anybody? Any questions? No? All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you have a good rest of your week.